Rebecca Mercer, a PhD student at Aos University and cryptography researcher. Thanks for being with us, Rebecca. Thank you. Um, okay, so my talk is about privacy in a cryptocurrency world. And I just wanted to start this to say that I don't think this has been said enough at this conference, that blockchains without privacy are useless. Um, like, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, like, at best, they're useless. At worst, they're quite harmful, um, especially if people you give people, like, false impressions that they do actually have privacy. So... Um, this is actually an exploration. This talk is going to be an exploration of the space of privacy and what we do know and what we don't know. And I think the, yeah, and I mean, we can discuss. So, oh, this is weird. Um, so, first of all, oh, this is really weird. Um, so, first of all, uh, just this is kind of the layer zero and layer one of blockchains. So on the layer zero, we have the network layer. So this is where transactions get broadcast to the nodes and they like reach consensus on which transaction to include. And this, there is a privacy leak at this layer as well. And this is to do with like IP addresses and MAC addresses and where the transactions come from. And if you have like network sniffers, I guess, you might be able to identify things um, relationships between people and their IP addresses and make meaningful privacy leaks at this layer. This isn't what this talk is going to be about. The, this talk is going to be about the like application layer. So in Bitcoin, this is where the transactions lie. And in Ethereum, this is where both transactions and um, like smart contract execution lies. Super weird. Um, scroll, scroll, scroll. So first of all, we're going to start with mixes and tumblers. And this is an overview. And I'm kind of going to preface this with saying I don't think mixes and tumblers get enough credit. So people see, we're going to see CoinJoin, and people see CoinJoin, and they see that, um, what do they see about CoinJoin? They see that there's transactions, there's money going into a place, and then there's money coming out of a place. And you see these big, scary transactions and talks that have been previous to this one, like at different conferences. and. Sometimes with these, you can do like intersection attacks. Like if a 3.08 goes in and a 3.08 goes out, you can say like maybe these two people, this is the same guy. And so there's like this reduced anonymity set um, in this way. But I think there's actually a lot we can still gain with these. So, so the first way to get mixing on blockchain would be if you have this central tr trusted mixer. So in this way, you have the most simple protocol. You have that coins can go into the mixer. You, so Charlie and Alice here would tell the mixer, or the Bitcoin bath in this case, they would t like Charlie would say, I want this money to go to Bob. And Alice would say, I want this money to go to Dora. And then the Bitcoin bath would send the money to Dora and send the money to Bob. And maybe they'd be incentivized um, to actually pass this money along. Maybe they wouldn't. But in this case, they're trusted a lot. This is actually quite cute. Um, so they're trusted both not to steal the money, they're trusted not to go offline um, indefinitely and just have the money stuck in this like stuck state. And they're also trusted with anonymity because if you, if the way that you're moving money is that you as Charlie tell someone else, I want this money to go to Bob, then someone knows that link of like, you want this money to go to Bob. And um, there's there's not a way we can get around this with this like central trusted mixer. Um, so, but the way that they people did get around this, and on Bitcoin in particular, and they worked really hard and made this really compatible solution with Bitcoin. And it uses two escrows, and there's like a tumbler, and they're not trusted not to run away with the money anymore. There's no way in this case that um, Alice can give the tumbler the money and not have like this promise that Bob will get that money. And um, this, I mean, the results that they achieve are brilliant. Like, the Tumblr doesn't know the link between Alice and Bob. So they do an interaction with Alice. The Alice gets like a, it's like a puzzle. Um, to, yeah, a solution to a puzzle. They do like some interaction with Bob. Bob g gives the solution to the puzzle, but they blind it in this way that even the tumbler in the middle, even though they are receiving money and they're releasing money, they don't actually know these mappings of like sender to recipient. Um, and this is great. So 
in terms of like overall. So in these slides, pink means awful. Um, gray is kind of like neutral and blue is great. So in the naive solution, we have the trusted dealer trusted with anonymity, but to um, just someone who's observing on the network, we actually have like an okay situation. It's like loads of things go into a place, loads of things come out of a place. Um, availability in both cases, if you have this central mixer is it's like you are depending on that mixer, even if you're not depending on them not to, if you, even if you've incentivized the person not to run away with the money ever, there's no way you can incentivize, a, like there's no way you can force a central server which is removed from the blockchain just to stay around forever. Um, with theft prevention, in the first case, they can actually steal from you. In the Tumblebit case, they actually can't. But then in terms of messages, we have this quite, like Tumblebit introduces a lot of messages. And we, know, even though there's still a central mixer, there's like a lot of operations that have to happen for you to get around um, the, to get around the trust issues. Um, in terms of transactions, these are both worse than one, but they're both not that bad. Um, but yeah, the big problem is this Tumblr could run away. So we can remove the central mixer and the way that this can be done in different ways. So there's like, there's CoinJoin that does this and this is the next slide. And the way that CoinJoin does this is, so in this case, Alice and Charlie would get together off chain in some way. So they could use some private communication if they know each other and they know like we want to transfer some money. Um, or they could use IRC or some other way to like a bulletin board to broadcast their intention to spend money in the future. And then they all get together, they pass around all of the addresses that they want to send money to and they tr perform a transaction over all of these and then they pass around that transaction and all sign it. So in this case, you, you have this like you have this decentralized mixer, so it's like all of the money goes in, all of the money comes out. You don't have these one-to-one -one mappings anymore, but still, in this case, you have some problems. So anonymity, you uh, so so the R means that you have anonymity with respect to the recipient. So in this case, it's actually quite interesting that all of the senders obviously know exactly what address they're transferring money to. So then if I was to transfer money to someone else, I could then watch on the blockchain to see how that person spends the money. And this isn't ideal, obviously. Um, but in the actual recipients don't learn which sender was theirs because they're hidden in this big block um, in amongst all of the others. Then for uh, availability, this is kind of okay. What, there's this attack where you can voice an intention to spend money and you can go along and you can build up the transaction and then you can refuse to sign it. And in this way, everyone else has to renegotiate and make a new transaction and pass around the new transaction. So it's like you can inconvenience other people a lot, but you can't steal from anybody. And in terms of off-chain messages, this is quite bad. Like you need to, everyone needs to communicate to everyone multiple times. But in terms of transactions, it's brilliant. Um, and then, so this has a lot of off-chain ch communication, but then XIM was introduced, which had the absolute goal of no off-chain communication. So they use the Bitcoin network or whatever blockchain that you're interested in as the as the communication hub. So you voice your intention to make a, a private transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain and then somebody else meets up with you and then you, you commit to this and then you can kind of transfer your money together in this way where it comes from one of the two of you and goes to like one of the two of your recipients and the people who are observing on the blockchain don't know which this is. So this has no off-chain communication and then it has like really good results with respect to guarantees of like, because you have these commitments so the other person can't ever say like, oh, I'm gonna transfer money. Ah, actually, I don't wanna transfer money. Um, but in terms of actual transactions on chain, this is this is really bad, and this is quite bad in the situation that we live in today because the transactions on chain are the things you want to minimise. Um, so, yeah. So the limitation with decentralised mixes at this point is that they really need to do all this communication. So it's either you trust someone and then they can act as your hub, or you have to like work together 
between yourselves and then you don't get these you don't get the negatives of having a centralized server, but you also don't get the benefits at all. So this is where Mobius came along. And this is my paper with Sarah Micklejohn. And what we did was we just used Ethereum as the hub. And so you can do this uh, like in this cryptographically secure way, and we prove that um, everything's great. And you get, you have, you have like availability is insured by the blockchain. It's like as long as the blockchain's there, your transaction is going to go through. You, uh, there's no chance that anyone can steal from you. In terms of off-chain messages, you need two originally to set up the transaction, and then you and the person who you want to transfer money to can transfer indefinite amounts of money back and forth between you without having to communicate offline ever again. Um, but in terms of on-chain transactions, it's two. So it's like there's a deposit stage and then there's a withdrawal stage. And this has actually the flip verse of anonymity is all of the usual ones because like in all of the like Bitcoin based mixes, what you do is you know the address of the person who you want to send money to and um, you know their address. And so you can watch that address and the money that moves out of it potentially. In Mobius, we have the opposite case. So you as a sender send money to this smart contract and then your recipient can withdraw from the smart contract and you don't learn which of the people who's wrote the drawing is your recipient you there's there's nothing you can learn um that will help you identify them so the way we do this is we use public keys and we use ring signatures so the all that the senders have to do is they deposit the money and they deposit a public key which they know that their sender can derive a secret key that corresponds to um, and they deposit these into a smart contract. And this doesn't reveal any information about this recipient because these are like newly derived public keys, they're fresh. And this doesn't, yeah. Um, and then the next thing that happens is the, once as many of these have been deposited as you are like comfortable with, as your anonymity set, all of the people can start withdrawing. So they withdraw with the linkable ring signature, which ensures that the, every person can draw, withdraw only once, once and only once, um, but no one who has all of the information about all of the public keys can tell which recipient corresponds to which public key. So like my favorite, the most interesting use case for this, I think, is if you, if you have like one of these centralized exchanges where it goes from fiat to cryptocurrency, these people need to do KYC. Um, and so they, they know your name and they know like your passport details or whatever you've had to give to them. And then they want to they want to like give you your cryptocurrency. But what happens if you don't want your cryptocurrency to be like associated with your real name? Um, and so this is actually something that they could do. So the exchangers could put the money into a smart contract with a key that they know that you would be able to withdraw from. And then in this way, you, you could have it so they actually don't know which of the money on chain corresponds to which of the people. They know that you've definitely, you definitely have the right to have some money on chain, but they don't know which one you actually are, which I think is super interesting. Um, so the pros of mixes are like, you get network effects. If there's people doing this, then you can join in. Um, it's compatible with existing infrastructure. Like you can, if you can send a Bitcoin transaction, you can send a Bitcoin transaction. If you can like make an Ethereum smart contract call, then you can use mixes. They're, they're quite easy to use. Um, pretty much if you can think of some properties that you want, like less trust, more trust, um, like auditing, linkability, whatever you want. You can probably design a mixer that will give you exactly what you want. Um, and the anonymity set probably grows and grows. So this, this isn't something which has been looked into very much in the cryptocurrency space, because the where, where people go to get their information about um, cryptocurrencies that work kind of like this is Monero. And Monero had this kind of badly enforced up until January or up until late last year or whenever it was. And so the things that people can analyze aren't the things exactly as they should be analyzed. And so we haven't had a lot of analysis in this area of how transactions and their anonymity sets appear in a whole global blockchain level rather than like on a kind of broken blockchain level. Um, so I think this is like, an, this is a very interesting place for people to like put their machine learning algorithms. Um, 
but there are some cons, like sometimes you're going to have to trust someone not to steal all of your money. This is probably not ideal. They can involve a lot of co coordination, which is also very not ideal. And you're very reliant on like other people doing things which are very similar to the things that you want to do, which is also not ideal. Um, so here we go to the world of private cryptocurrencies. So Zcash is brilliant. Um, the way that I view Zcash is a cloud of zero knowledge. So everything, so Zcash has like its Z addresses and its T addresses. And ex like a lot of the infrastructure uses T addresses, which is very like disappointing to the cryptographer in me. Um, and but the way where you, that you could view Zcash is it is just this giant cloud of zero knowledge. And the T to Z transactions, they're the ones that arrows pointing into this cloud of zero knowledge. And then in the zero knowledge cloud, who knows what happens? And then the Z to T transactions, these are the ones going out of the cloud of zero knowledge. And so um, this is like a way that it uses ZK Snarks to move money around. And this is a way where we can get privacy as well. And then outside of this cloud is the scary non-zero knowledge world. And this is where a lot of the transactions actually happen. Um, and then the other main private cryptocurrency is Monero. And here I've done something which is kind of in contrast with something which I said earlier, which is like I've taken one transaction in isolation. So in Monero, if you don't know already, uh, instead of just transferring money from one UTXO to a new like public key or hash of a public key or whatever you want, you instead um, you instead move it from a selection of public keys and move it to this output public key. But you use a ring signature, and so you, the people who can have a view of like this transaction wouldn't know which of these original public keys this money was actually being transferred from. But the problem with this is you need to keep all of these public keys around. So you don't know which one the money has moved out of, and so you need to keep all of the old ones, and you also need to keep track of that new one now. So this question we asked ourselves was like, is this inherent? Because this, the same things happen happens in Zcash. They have these like trees of nullifiers, and you, oh wait, and you see, you, it's like you see things are happening, but you can't get rid of any of the old things because like you can't cancel one thing out every time one thing happens because this would make a link between these things so clearly. Um, but it turns out that we don't need to do the pros and cons. Um, it turns out that actually this isn't inherent at all. And the way we can have private cryptocurrencies without a constantly growing UTXO set is if we just use update for public keys. So in, we can do, so what we do in this case is you have a group of public keys to start with and a group of public keys to end with. And all of the all of the public keys that you don't control the secret key that corresponds to are just re-randomizations of the old ones. And so the person who could spend the old one is the person who can spend the new one. But then you just have your one, which is called PK new, which is a spending of PK4. Um, and this one is controlled. PK4 actually sent this to a new person. And PK new is the secret key that corresponds to that public key is controlled by a new person. So in this way, we can cross out all of the old public keys and just keep around all of the new public keys. And then we haven't made the set of public keys grow. Um, and the way we do this, do I have time hmm, to teach you some public key cryptography? The way that we do this is the secret key in like Bitcoin and every cryptocurrency that I know of is the discrete log of the public key. So we can define public keys in a way that you can re-randomize the public key, but the discrete log of this public key does not change. And the way you do this is if you have public keys which are uh, a base of a group and then this base to the power of the secret key, you can just keep, so this is this would be in finite field representation, which is, for elliptic curves, it looks a little bit different. But um, you just keep multiplying by random numbers. And the discrete log of these, the relationship between the discrete log of the second random number, um, of the second number, with respect to the first number, doesn't change. So all of the other public keys in the system, even though the public key looks different, the secret key actually looks exactly the same. And so those people can spend this money. Um, and they've just like, so it's just like, it's constant mixing. It's like automatic mixing all of the time. So every time one transaction happens, a bunch of, like, a bunch of public keys get re-randomized, um, which I think is really cool. Um, yeah. 
Oh, oh yeah, and the, the point of the point why the other reason why this is cool is because we know how to prove things about this uh, this relationship between public keys and secret keys very efficiently. So all you need to do in this case would be prove PK3 is a re-randomization of one of those original public keys, PK5 is, everything else is, and then PK new you prove, I know the secret key that corresponded to the public key that moved the money into this one. You, you have to, pretty much you prove, I know one of these secret keys and N minus one are just re-randomizations of the old ones. And these are both pretty easy statements to prove in like concrete, efficient terms, um, which is cool. So if you want more, the paper is coming one day. Um, here in my beautiful co-authors. Um, that is all. Thanks. Go ahead.